Zealand working here now for a whole five weeks. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I come from um, m most recently having been working in Melbourne for the past seven years. I spent three years as an associate pastor and have been sole charge of two churches for the past four years. So it's, it's an exciting change for me to be taking on women's and children's ministries and most exciting that I'm in this wonderful country called New Zealand and I'm getting to see all these beautiful and fabulous things which I'm very much enjoying so far. I was in Sydney this weekend so I brought back this little Australian sniffle. Um, so it's not a New Zealand sniffle, it's an Australian one but I'm sure we'll muddle through together today. Let's just um, bow our heads and pray. Gracious God, we just want to come into your presence. We want to hear your voice speaking to each one of us on, at our different stages and on the different places of the, the journeys of our lives that, that you will speak to our hearts today and that we will leave here knowing that, um, that you have been here, that you have spoken and your words have been said. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When I was pastoring at Fern Tree Gully, I came in contact with a woman named Michelle. Michelle came from an unchurched background. She'd always, from a very little girl, had a sense of God. Her family life was not a particularly happy place. And so as a little girl, she would, she would pray, even though nobody told her how to, or even though she was never taught, she would pray when things were stressful at home. And so even though she had no religious input, no formal uh, Sabbath school or Sunday school or, or even religious education, she would talk to God. And when she was about 15, she came in contact with a young man and they hooked up, I think is the appropriate terminology these days. They hooked up and um, Gavin lived with his dad. His parents had divorced when he was about eight and he had gone to live with his dad when he was nine and his mum and his other brothers and sisters had gone in another direction. And um, that direction was towards church. And so when he was about 20, he and his now girlfriend, Michelle, um, came in contact with his mum again. And they started um, spending more time with her until finally Michelle had a little boy and his name was Lachlan. And so Nanny offered to take Lachlan to church. And so little tiny Lachlan in arms started going to Sabbath school and church. And so as he got old enough, he started sitting in his, sitting in his high chair, refusing to eat his food until um, they had said grace. So Lachlan, the 18-month-old evangelist, refuses to let his parents eat until they've said grace. Arms cl clumps together for prayer. He says, dear Jesus, amen. And he started telling his parents all of the wonderful things that he learned in Sabbath school. He started telling them that Jesus loved them. Until Michelle thought, if this is good for my kid, then maybe it's good for me. And she came to church. And finally, after a few weeks, I said, is church a bit confusing sometimes? And she agreed that maybe it was. And I said, would you like me to explain some, some of it to you at home? I could come and we could open our Bibles together and we could do Bible studies. And we began this amazing journey of studying the Bible with Michelle. And I, um, I was privileged to watch her go through her, her second pregnancy and, and Lara be born. And um, then Layla came along and she was born. And we'd been studying together for about 18, maybe nearly 20 months. And I you know, really wanted to start to, to broach the topic of baptism with Michelle, but she was really anti the whole idea you know, of public expressions and public commitments. And, and we talked about it one day at Bible study and she said, no, Kyle, I just don't think I need to be baptised. I love God. Um, I love what we le I learn at church. I think church is for me. Um, you know, but I don't think I need to, to do this thing called baptism. It's not really kind of, really it wasn't her cup of tea. She got married with three people present in Las Vegas because weddings were not her thing either. So, um, so, so you can see how the whole standing in, in front of a whole church and getting baptised was not going to be a cup of tea. And so the next 
Coincidentally, the very next Sabbath was a baptism and I baptised a young woman named Kimberly. Kimberly is 22 and um, has um, Down syndrome and she wanted to be baptised and so I studied with her and Kimberly stood up the front in church and um, recited to everybody John 3.16 and stood in the waters of baptism. Well, the next week I went to Bible study with Michelle and I said, Michelle, what did you think of the baptism? And her whole face lit up. And um, she said, Kylie, at home I've got three little kids and they all, I read them a story at night. And there's this, always there's this vying for the first spot on the seat because Lachlan is five and Lara is two and extraordinarily tenacious and Layla's just a baby in arms. And so she says, the two of them are fighting for the spot on the knee and so if after all this sort of pushing and shoving, I get Lachlan on, on one side and Lara on the other side and Layla kind of laying across the middle and I read a story and she said, Kylie, for so long I felt like... Um, I have been watching everybody else on God's lap and now I want to be first on his lap. I want to be the first one sitting right up there and I want God to read me a story. And I said, but Michelle, God does not just want to read you a story. He wants to write a story with your life. And we started talking about baptism. In fact, we had um, my last Sabbath at Fentree Gully, we had four baptisms, baby dedication, the ambulance come and my leaving. <laughs> it was a fairly intense kind of day. And um, as Michelle hugged me goodbye, she said, Gavin and I are going to come to New Zealand to get baptised. I don't know whether they'll make it to this beautiful country, but nonetheless, the declaration is that Michelle not only wants to hear God tell her a story, that she wants to stand up before men and declare that she wants to let God write a story with her life. Because God does want to talk to us. He does want to read us a story. He has so many beautiful things to tell us. If, if I could describe the heart of God, it would be to take each one of us cl- right close to him and tell us all the things that he, he has intended for us to hear since the beginning of the world, to tell us that he made this world for us. And that he loves us, that we are precious in his eyes, that he sent his only son Jesus to die for us and that he loves us so much that that he would do that and that we now have the most amazing intercessor in Jesus. But God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to take us on a journey with him where he, the God that made the entire universe, that put every single thing in place, and we're talking about the world being exactly right on its axis. So, I I don't know the science of all this, but you know how if you go half a millimetre this way, we're going to burn, and if you go half a millimetre the other way, we're going to freeze? God did that. He's pretty smart, because I can't even get the math right. I don't get it. But God knows how to do it. And the God that is that infinitely smart enough to put the world just right on its axis, that God says, I want to talk to you and I want to work with you to write the story of your life. The, the, the girl, our little girls read, our medium girls, sorry, our teenage girls, read the beautiful passages from scripture where God gives us all these promises. He says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future. Before you were even born, every day was ordained for you, written in your word. If that's not a God who wants to write my story, I don't know what is. If you'd like to turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. Jeremiah Chapter 1 and verse 5. Here is um, the prophet Jeremiah been asked to do a special task and to take a special, special message to Israel at, um, at a time of kind of conflict for them. 
And Jeremiah isn't so keen on the idea. He thinks that maybe he's too young or not qualified or, in fact, not the right person for the job. And God here says in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, Before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Then I said, but Lord God, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a boy. But the Lord said to me, don't say that I'm only a boy. You must go wherever I send you and you must say everything that I tell you. Don't be afraid of anyone because I am with you to protect you, says the Lord. So Jeremiah starts to have a little whinge. God asks him to do a task and he really isn't sure that he's qualified. Um, Haven't we heard this a few times? But but I don't know how. Really, surely somebody else would be better for the task than me. I'm, I'm not trained. If I was trained, then maybe I could do it. And I'm definitely too young or too old or too in between. I can't possibly uh, do this special task that God um, would have me do. And God responds and he says, well, you know what? I made you. I put you together in your mother's womb. And I chose you for this job. Me, I picked you. And before you were even born, I set you apart for this special task. So you might not feel qualified, you not might feel old enough, you might feel too old. However it is you feel, I made you for this because I'm your God and I'm going to be with you every single step of the way so don't fear the tasks that I have for you because I'm your God and I've been writing your story before you even realised it. There's a new book at the moment that's out. It's one of those, you know, management style things that that you get when you're a manager to to read about being a better manager. Uh, It's called Emotional Capitalists, The New Leaders by Martin Newman. And the whole premise of the book is that companies these days can't afford to just look at the bottom line. So for all the accountants present, money going Coming in, money going out, there has to be some left. That's basic accounting. My accounting is as good as my science. You've got to have some money in the bank, right? Left at the end of the day. The bottom line has to have cash in it. And Martin Newman suggests that that businesses just cannot afford anymore to just be looking at the bottom line. They cannot just be measuring what comes in and what comes out because a business not only needs to have financial capital but it needs to have emotional capital. Are people connected with this brand? Do they like it? Do they have an allegiance and a loyalty to it? And the the same for employees. Do they feel excited about being in the organisation? Because if they don't, you're not going to get any work out of them. And um, they're not going to stay a very long time and training up staff is actually a really difficult thing to do. So not only do um, your customers but your employees have to have this emotional investment in the company. And so Martin Newman goes on to say, well, if you're going to be a leader leading in the world that requires um, the building of emotional capital, then then these are the criteria that you need to have to be one of these leaders in this emotional capitalist kind of world. And so I'm reading this book and going, yeah, this is really true. This is really good. This is good for church life. This is good for leaders. And I open the next paragraph and the first of the seven characteristics that you need to be a leader um, that builds emotional capital is independence. And I went... What? What's that got to do with building emotional capital? This, you know, am I in the right book? Something's wrong here. But when you think about it, it does ring kind of true. That to be a leader, to be a person, there's kind of two choices that we've got in life. You can kind of go a bit like Jeremiah. Woe is me. It's all too hard. Everything happens around me and I've got no control over my environment and you know, I've really got no choices and we call that a victim. Or you can be independent and say, I choose. I choose my life. 
I choose the decisions I make, and some things I have no control over, but the things I do have control over, I work with and I make legitimate, significant choices. Don't just let it kind of fly by me. I actually choose. And I agree with Martin Newman to that point. Except I say, if I'm going to be an independent, competent, functioning adult, I have made a choice. And that my choice is to let God be the author and the finisher of my faith. To let God guide my journey and write my story. Because Martin Newman suggests that in businesses, we should not see ourselves as CEOs, chief executive officers, that the CEO needs to see themselves as a C. F-O, no, C-S-O. Oh, no, that's the finance people. Chief financial officer, chief storytelling officer. That's what the CEO does. They help the group tell the story, right? And that we need to be the chief storytelling officers of our own lives. And I say, because I have chosen to write my story, I will let God do it for me. Because the God who is infinitely wise, who is infinitely good, who is infinitely great has offered. And the best, most independent choice I ever made was to let God lead. The choice that I'm so excited that Michelle has made. Led to church by her evangelist child. Letting God be the chief storytelling officer of each and every one of our lives. That's the choice that you and I have before us to say, yeah, I'll let God lead. And I choose to let God lead because he is the most amazing storyteller. I have to confess to you that I have what I call a useless gift. I can tell a story anytime, anywhere. It's my thing. You give me three words and I'll tell you a story right here and right now. Oh, we're running out of time, maybe we won't. Uh, but my friends know about this useless gift of mine and so we end up in these scenes like my house back in Victoria had this beautiful open fire and we would sit around the open fire and my friends who knew would say, Kylie, tell us a story. And so I would, um, they'd give me three words and I would just tell them a story like that. And my friends say to me, how do you do it? And I'm like, it's really easy. In fact, telling a, st a good story is almost formulaic. It was a dark and windy night as the clouds swirled around in the blackness. What do you have there? You have a setting, right? So you go, and the children huddled in absolute fear underneath the house. What do you have then? You have intrigue. They were desperately waiting for their father to come home because Dad said he was coming home. And all of a sudden, you have a story. You have the setting, you have the element of intrigue added to some tension or some plot. There's a storm, right? And there are children huddling underneath the house. But something actually has to happen in the story for it to be a story. There needs to be some sort of conflict. And the conflict is, they're huddling underneath the house and they're waiting for their dad to come home and they're worried that he might be caught in the storm. Right? So you just get, people tell me three words and so I immediately just allow pictures to flood into my mind of the setting. So when I did this at my local church back in Melbourne, somebody said spaghetti and somebody said a spider. And somebody said a torch, and I went spaghetti. Okay, see a plate of spaghetti, see a spider. Oh, they have to be camping. Where, where else are you going to have a torch and a spider and, and spaghetti, right? Now, I'm not the, not the world's greatest storyteller or anything, but I, I'm, I'm telling you this because it really is the easiest thing in the world to do. If you know the, the elements that ne are needed to go together to make a good story. Like, have you ever got stuck in the supermarket with somebody telling you a story? And they go, and then I went to the bank. No, was it the bank? I might have gone to the post office first. No, it was the bank. Yes, I definitely went back to the bank. And then to the post office. And after I'd been to the post office, 
I walked down the road, took a right hand turn and I finally got to the chemist and I walked in the door of the chemist and there standing in the chemist and you're like, oh, <laughs> too many details. <laughs> it, it, too many details. Just, I don't need to know. What, what, what makes a good story was, guess what? I walked into the door of the chemist today and you would never imagine who was standing there. There was this ex-boyfriend of mine that I hadn't seen in 20 years and he looked like he was now a drug addict. <laughs> like, that's a story. Everybody's going, ooh, does she really have an ex-boyfriend who's a drug addict? <laughs> you know, that's a story. And I say this to illustrate the point that a good storyteller knows how to do it well. And God is the most amazing storyteller. He knows that a good story needs a setting, it needs the element of, of intrigue, and then a plot. And I believe that God takes each of us on the journey of our lives if we let him. If we choose, he will take us on the most amazing and wonderful journey that we could never imagine. And as we go along, he brings us into a particular setting. He creates the intrigue and then the plot moves in. And he needs to do that. He needs to have that element of the unknown or the unsure or even the uncomfortable because he knows that in each chapter of our lives he needs to grow us to get ready for the next part of the journey and the next part of the journey and the next part. So he's got this whole big plan going on as well as each of the chapters in between. So he brings us in into a particular setting, he puts the intrigue in and then he begins to do his work to grow us to get ready to move to each of the stages of the journeys of life. You know sitting around the fire at my house in Melbourne, my, my closest friend in, in Melbourne is a statistician. She runs this thing called the Living in Australia study. It's a longitudinal study. They do one in every country. So she's really very statistically minded. And she's even been to New Zealand to train the New Zealand people. And she was in Korea last week talking about statistics, each to their own. So, so we, she's one of my friends who often says, tell a story, tell a story, right? So I'm, I'm right on the edge of the, it was a dark and stormy night. The children were carefully huddled and then she will just come out with and then the donkey spoke. I'm absolutely serious. I'm such an example. Like right at the moment of tension and intrigue, right at you know the one of those feeling moments where you're about to describe that the princess fell into the prince's, you know, whatever, right at that moment Nicole will go, the donkey spoke. And she really has a thing for talking animals, so it's sometimes a donkey speaking or one time it was a magic frog appeared. And for the first few times that she did this, I was quite overwhelmed because, you know, I'm doing this intense kind of emotional journey thing because I'm quite fond of black prose too, you know, like, um, and you have to ask the question whether unspoken words ever really go away. Or do they go to a place in your heart labelled what might have been? Uh, right at that moment, Nicole says, and then the donkey spoke. And I just, at first, I was so overwhelmed with her ridiculousness because talking donkeys are okay in the right context. There was a slave girl walk, working on the farm. Her life was boring and difficult. She wished for something more than what her slave girl life had. She was walking along the road one day when the donkey spoke. It's perfect, hey? It's a fairy tale, it works. But in the midst of, of unspoken words ever really going away, a talking donkey doesn't fit. So on reflecting on this one day, I realised that sometimes in stories you get things thrown at you that are completely abstract and you need to actually be able to go with them rather than ignoring them. And so, Nicole throws me the talking donkey or the magic frog and I just started absorbing them in the story. The children are huddled underneath of the house, frightened and alone, wondering whether Dad would ever really come home because they'd only ever seen a storm this difficult and this hard before. They heard kind of a, a neighing noise. Could that be a donkey talking? Surely not. 
to be in that much fear that a donkey is talking is strange and obscure. And I've taken Nicole's element and learnt over time, because we've been friends a while now, to weave the insane and obscure into the pictures of my stories. And I think God is most amazingly the same. I don't believe that the God causes evil in our lives. Because we're going on this journey, these journeys that we have, and sometimes good things happen, and sometimes bad. And I don't believe in writing our story, God sits down and says, right, we're going to put a bad thing right here. That's not the God that I serve. He works through his character, which is grace and mercy and justice and truth and goodness. But the devil has an amazing ability to throw um, nastiness at us to try and get us off course. And because he does not want any of us to experience the goodness of God, or even the goodness of life. But God is the most amazing storyteller. That he can take the talking donkeys that the devil throws at us and weave them into our story to make them for good. I love the story of Joseph partly because it's an amazing example of how God just uses every part of the journey and every part of the story. Here's a young man who's the, you know, our youngest in his family who God puts visions of his, on his heart to be a leader, which seems so obscure because he's the youngest and in their culture, the youngest was never the leader, ever. But God puts on his heart leadership and then he ends up in a pit and sold into slavery. And finally, he becomes the leader of the slaves in Potiphar's house. And then Potiphar's wife doesn't get her own way and he's back in jail. And he becomes a leader amongst the jailers. And he gets overlooked again when he is forgotten. Until you know the story, finally he gets the most amazing opportunity to lead an entire nation. Having been fully prepared for his leadership position, even though would we have said that Joseph was on the career path to politics? No. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, at the end of the story, Joseph's father dies. He's now back in relationship with his brothers and they get frightened when dad dies that Joseph is going to revisit the whole pit experience and that they did it. And so they come to Joseph and say, are you going to kill us? You know, with fear and trepidation. And with tears in his eyes, Joseph says, verse 19, don't be afraid, can I do what only God can do? You meant, it, you meant to hurt me, but God turned your evil into good to save the lives of many, which is being done. So don't be afraid, I will take care of your children. I quote that line a lot. It says different things in different versions, but the version I love says of verse 20, what the devil intends for evil, God uses for good. That's how I understand the world. That's how I understand sin in the world and sin in my life and in my story. That what the devil intended for evil to bring Joseph away from leadership, God actually twisted into the story to prepare him for leadership. And if you look at the amazing examples that we have in scripture, we see that pattern repeated over and over and over again. Moses, from the moment that he was born, his life was preserved. He went to work for an Egyptian princess and he learnt how to lead a nation. And it went astray when he spent 40 years hanging out in the desert looking after sheep, but he knew that desert after 40 years. So if you're going to lead a nation through it, it's great that you know it. Every character of scripture we can see God's hand in leading them, in growing them, in helping them to be the people he would have us to be. He does all of it. He writes each and every story so at the end of the story he is glorified and so that his character is upheld and that the people around each of those amazing figures of faith in scripture have a better understanding of who God is. That's his goal and his objective. 
that our lives, that our stories might reflect who God is to everyone around us. Everybody is at a different stage and a different place on their journey. And I think it's a worthwhile thing for all of us as communities of believers to acknowledge that we all are on different journeys. And so we're at different places and we need different things. I'm a 31-year-old single pastor. So what I need is very different from the person next to me who, who is a 45-year-old married pastor with six children. We all see the world differently. We'll experience the world differently. But if we can actually have the courage to support each other in our journeys, knowing that God is guiding each and every one of us. So where we are on our journey is okay and where you are on our journey is okay because there's no better or worse journey, it's just different. And if God is in charge of it, then it's the best place that you can ever, ever be. The choice is ours, individually. Who would you like to write your story? Who would we like to write the story of this church, of this community, of this nation, of this world? The choice is up to you and I. Individually, we can choose. Collectively, we can choose to allow God to be the chief storytelling officer of our lives, of our churches, and I pray one day very soon of our world. Gracious God in heaven, we offer ourselves up to you and ask you to be the chief storytelling officer of our lives. Father, lead us. Write the story of us each individually and play here as we want you to be in charge. Father, we choose you.